Hello and welcome to this very special episode uh, of Frankly Speaking. And joining me tonight is Neil deGrasse Tyson, the man who's popular, astrophysicist. Uh, he's an author and he's very popular in India because he's the man who met with Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, a year or two ago and uh, the man who talks about India's ambitious space plans. Thank you very much, uh, Neil Tyson, for joining me. And uh, I want to begin with uh, the book you once wrote and uh, five years ago, and you congratulated NASA on its 60th birthday, and you said there's a lot to be done, and uh, dreams of a nation actually are fueled by a pipeline of ambitious students eager to become scientists, engineers, and technologists. Do you think your dream is coming true, uh, not just uh, in the United States, but across the world? Yes, definitely. And just before I continue, let me welcome you to my city. You are there in Times Square. This is my native town. Uh, I was born and raised there, so just welcome. Uh, and I'm delighted to be uh, doing this with you, standing in the middle of the one of the big arteries of New York City. And uh, I, I want to emphasize that when people explore what policy, what ideas, what dreams can drive a nation's ambitions, space exploration always works its way to the top of that because we all spend time looking up and wondering. We've been doing this long before we had the technology to give us access to space. And you realize when one of your, one of your citizens goes into space, they become a local hero. And people ask, well, who are they? Uh, what did they study in school? Uh, I, I, maybe I want to be them. And then you find out that it's not just space and engineering, that matter to going into space. There's biology that relates to the human condition while we are in space. There's geology, except it would be Marsology or Moonology, Ge the study of the rocks and the, the formation and the history of these cosmic objects. Then, so there's all manner of technology and engineering that comes together to achieve these goals. And each one of those, each one of those fields has the potential and has demonstrated it to be so, has the potential to create new economic opportunities for a nation. Because as we all know, innovations in science and technology are the engines of tomorrow's economy. This is true no matter where you are in the world. And even advances in farming have come about from advances in technology applied to it. And so, so any, a country that ignores a future in space is in part ignoring the, the health and, and, the, and the, the vitality of their future economy. Let me ask you what is your assessment of uh, uh, India's own space mission, especially Chandrayaan-3, uh, India's uh, moon mission, which was the first uh, time that uh, anybody, uh, first country that landed uh, on the south pole of the moon in August last year. How do you see that and uh, how do you assess, uh, you know, since then, what we've learned from this moon mission? So the, let me unpack that because you make some very important uh, uh, points. So first of all, the, uh, there's an old joke in, in aerospace, which is it's easy to land somewhere. You just want to land safely, okay? So, so India was not the first to land on the South Pole. It was the first to land softly and safely. Uh, Russia had a failed mission. There have been other failed missions. So that's the real achievement. Not that India landed on the moon, but that India landed safely in the South Pole region. And I, I can't overemphasize the value of that region of the moon. If you if give you a moment, I'd like to explain. Um, it, on the moon, the sun does rise and set everywhere. There is no dark side of the moon, first of all. But a day lasts about a month. They have like 14, 15 days of sunlight, 15 days of night. As you go towards the poles, the sun's arc in the sky 
gets lower and lower. Same is true on Earth. All right, if you go to the polar regions, the sun doesn't get very high in the sky. It stays low from when it rises all the way to when it sets. Same is true on the moon. If you go to the South Pole, the, moon, the, the South Pole, the sun remains so low that there are craters with crater rims where sunlight never reaches the basin of the crater, ever. And they're called cold traps. These are places where literally the sun don't shine. And why is that important? Because as you, we all know, as is evidenced from all the craters, the sun gets hit by asteroids, by comets. So does Earth, but our atmosphere protects us. That's why we don't look like the moon. But all these craters, what happens if a comet hits? A comet has water. The water scatters onto the lunar surface. If the sun hits that area, it evaporates. But if the water falls into the bottom of one of these craters that never see sunlight, then the water stays and will stay there for billions of years. And so we suspect, and we have good evidence to confirm, that at the bottoms of these craters near the poles, there's a reservoir of water molecules. And water is very important. Of, of course, you need it to drink. Um, you would need it if you had any kind of agriculture in a future in a future colony. But also, we remember that water is H2O. That's the, the chemical symbol for water. If you separate those and put them in separate tanks, and then you bring them together, it's rocket fuel. People think of, oh, it's fuck. Oh. Does he have to have gasoline or kerosene? No. Water is rocket fuel. Those two uh, atoms separated, that takes energy to do that, by the way. But when you bring them back together, it's what we call exothermic, chemically. Exothermic, it releases energy. And you know what the exhaust is? Steam. So, if you go to the moon, to where the water is, you have life-preserving water, you have rocket fuel, you could sustain a future colony with just a few extra supplies. It is the first step to the colonization of the moon. Let me uh, ask you, uh, how was your conversation with Prime Minister Modi when you met him and uh, uh, what kind of uh, discussions did you have as far as India's uh, plan as far as uh, space research goes, uh, uh, you know, were there any interesting insights that you could share with our audiences back home in India? Yeah, so Prime Minister, the Prime Minister did come through New York City. Again, that's my hometown. And I met with him. Uh, let me make that clear. Uh, he decided to meet with me. <laughs> I didn't summon him. Uh, he put in the request. And of course, I, I'm a world leader. You take any opportunity that's offered to meet and greet a world leader who help, who is shaping geopolitics. And so I, I, I definitely um, uh, 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 agreed to that uh, encounter. We met downtown and we spent maybe 20 minutes to half an hour in conversation. And over that time, he shared with me his space plans. All right. He wants to put in. Uh, education centers around the country to to uh, to excite children to think about space and science and math and technology um, and of course I didn't need to remind him of the significant historical value of the, the uh, Hindu uh, scholarship that has occurred in, in the centuries past major advances in mathematics uh, of course as we know we get our zero from from uh, uh, from I forgot exactly when it would have been 1,200 years ago, something like that. The, the zero, very important in all of math, comes from that culture. But I also commented that the Muslim culture in the golden age of Islam also has a lot of contributions. And the mixture of children of all backgrounds, if they're in the same room, you can say, look at all these great things that these cultures have done in the past. Let's bring it all together as an instrument of peace and of, of prosperity as we bring it together. So we had very good agreement on this about how you would 
um, have these discovery centers. He had maybe had a different term for it, but that's what we would call it here in the United States, a discovery center, a place where children can go and, and, and it can feed their curiosities because every child is curious. They're turning over rocks and looking behind trees, and that's something they're born with. It's only as adults as we kind of lose this, this urge to, to question or, or to, to, to explore the unknown. So if you can keep it going in children, you know what a scientist is? An adult scientist is a child who never grew up. <laughs> we still have our curiosity about the world. You did talk about uh, the stranded uh, Butch Wilmore and Sunita Williams uh, waiting for the SpaceX uh, uh, to come and rescue them, which uh, may not be earlier than uh, uh, early 2025. Uh, uh, what do you think about this and uh, uh, what do you think are going to be the ramifications uh, on the health uh, of missions as well as uh, on the health of individuals uh, stuck there uh, for periods that they had not bargained for? Yeah, remember that these people are professional astronauts, okay? They are professionals, so, and they've spent time in space before. They're people who spend a lot of money just to experience going into space. Now, they get the call from NASA that says, you have to spend more time in space than we originally bargained for. Do you think they are upset? <laughs> in my podcast, Star Talk, we interviewed <laughs> Sunita Williams on the space station. And she made it very clear. It, it, I don't know if it is posted yet, but it should post very soon, if not already. She made it very clear they have plenty to do there, and they have other friends, okay, that are, I mean, Stranded to Me was uh, in the movie The Martian, the character Mark Watney was left for dead on Mars. He was stranded. He didn't know if he could survive from day to day. There was nobody else around. We had to send another rescue mission, but it would take more than a year. That's stranded. But to be on a space station, where there's other astronauts and there's food and there's water. Yes, emotionally, you have to you have to convert from an eight-day mission to a seven-month mission or however long it will be. Yes, but these are these are these are physically and emotionally strong people who we select as astronauts, and that's true for any country who is sending their people up. So I have no concern. I'm not worried about them at all. And you know we're living in the future where NASA says. Who else has a rocket? Oh, SpaceX has a rocket. Come on in. That's how you know you're living in the future, when you, when you have option. Are you going to get onto a SpaceX uh, spaceship anytime soon? Uh... I, used to, I used to joke that um, the only time I'll get into somebody's spacecraft, let's take Elon's spacecraft, is after he has flown his mother. <laughs> successfully <laughs> then i'll know it's safe <laughs> to take um uh, I, i'm an astrophysicist so when i think of space i think of the, the the galaxy and the universe and so but we've all been conditioned to think of space as going to orbit around the earth so that's not spacey enough for me i wouldn't i would want to have a destination so if there's a ship going to the moon mars or beyond then I'll sign up and I'll get a good music okay. account and a video streaming account and maybe bring my family. I'm all good. But just to go in orbit around Earth, I, it's hard for me as an astrophysicist to get excited about that. And I can quantify this for you very simply. If you take Earth and make it the size of a schoolroom globe, the space station okay. orbits one centimeter above its surface. Space Station and uh, Elon Musk's orbital rocket, one centimeter above its surface. And the Bezos and Branson rockets that go up and down, they go the thickness of two dimes. Dime is our thinnest coin. That's how high above Earth they're going. I, I have to go somewhere. I don't want to just boldly go where hundreds have gone before. Send me to a new place and then I'll sign up. Okay, and, and uh, if Elon Musk were to ask you out for dinner right here uh, in New York City, what would your answer be? Oh, of course, of course. We, I, 
I've known him. Uh, we're not like drinking buddies, but we've met and we've known uh, we've known each other for I guess now almost two decades. Uh, and by the way, right? I I was told because I didn't see everybody else in the in who, who your prime minister had audience with in New York. I was told that Elon Musk had visited him just before I got there. So. Um, we, uh, ships crossed in the day when that had happened. But yes, I would definitely have. Uh, he's he's a powerful guy who has big visions on what space will bring to Earth, and also he made electric cars a a a daily subject of media coverage and people's ambitions for the future of transportation. Of course, he says all these other things that are just you know, by many measures is weird or different or whatever, and I can separate those, okay? I think I'm mature enough. I can say, okay, Elon, I don't agree with half of this other stuff, but this stuff is good. Let's talk about that. I can do that, and I think in a, a, a mature sh society should be able to have those kinds of conversations with people who um, in some circles are controversial. Before I let you go, I just want to know, do astrophysicists also have an insight into what's going to happen in elections? Because uh, in America, nobody seems to know <laughs> which way the elections are going. Uh, I thought, uh, why not bounce that off you? Maybe astrophysicists well, I, understand this better than anybody else. Well, we, in my field and science in general, we are very well trained in statistics and probability and in, in ways that the public should be, but isn't. And so that concerns me because many people make decisions about their life, their health, their wealth, their security with an incomplete knowledge of, of risk and probability and statistics. All I can tell you is that in the American system, um, the reason why it comes down to two candidates that are always sort of neck and neck is because the system weeds out people who are only getting 10 percent of the vote or 15 percent of the vote. We don't have a, a pluralistic election. So, so that's why the, the process winnows the candidates down to two that are sort of close to each other and then which makes practically every election a close one, where it wouldn't otherwise be if people didn't just drop out of the race or, or command some of the vote and keep it. As I understand many uh, uh, in Parliament, certainly in the UK, I'm less familiar with the Indian Parliament in this. So uh, it's winner takes all. And so that's the, that's the contest that's going on. No, but we don't have special insights. We have understanding of statistics, but in the physical sciences, we have no understanding of human behavior. <laughs> That's and therein. Well, I that thought, is a I bigger thought the mystery planetary the alignments would give you a sense. <laughs> no, <laughs> the, the planets and the rest of the universe. The, the, news alert: the planets and the universe do not care about you, okay, <laughs> or me, or anybody <laughs> else. We want them to care, we want to believe they care, but I assure you, they don't care. As, as Shakespeare said, uh, the fault, dear Brutus, lies not in the stars, but within ourselves. Well said, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Always a pleasure speaking with you. And uh, I know uh, many Indians who follow you, not just on social media, uh, but uh, what uh, you have uh, literally discovered and the barriers uh, that you have simplified for people to understand uh, space, uh, to understand our universe. Uh, thank you very much for joining me and thank you very much uh, for all those insights and always being such a sport when you speak with us. Uh, and many uh, Indians are huge fans of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thank you very much.